ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ offer our salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge. to lead us from death to immortality these prayers are very important for our spiritual life we constantly remember our goal our goal should be spiritual so it reminds us it keeps us awakened to the reality particularly in modern times how people have lost sight of the goal so we see lot of disharmony unrest throughout the world simply because they have lost the sight the spiritual goal is not in the forefront so you are seeing all types of tension disharmony going on in the whole world so it is very important for us to highlight the spiritual truths long back discovered by the rishis who are the scientists in the spiritual field we have scientists even today but they are exploring external they are exploring things which are non spiritual so with all these discoveries in the external world people are not happy at all simply because it is not spiritual so 
the scientists in the olden times gave primary importance for exploring the mystery of this universe. Why people are to suffer? Is it to suffer we have come into this world? Is it to exploit people that we have come into this world? Is it to simply wear out our senses and energy in useless things that we have come to this world? It is important to have these questions. So, spiritual life means those who take life in a spirit serious way. What's the meaning of taking life in a spiritual way, in a serious way? It means if you are taking the life in a spiritual way, that means you are really serious about your life. So, the Upanishads, the essence of the Vedas, the cream of the spiritual knowledge, are the fruits of the spiritual efforts done by the ancient rishis. Rishi means seer. A person who has realized the truth is called Rishi. Who is fully aware of the reality and so he is always cheerful and happy. He was overwhelmed by that cheerfulness and happiness. He wants to share that with fellow beings. So these truths have been revealed and they are being presented to us as Upanishads. It means spiritual knowledge which we call Vedanta. Vedanta means spiritual knowledge. So, all our attention must be focused on this important theme, Vedanta. It is to pinpoint this ideal Sri Ramakrishna came into this world out of his infinite compassion, out of his infinite love, he underwent tremendous sufferings. Finally he succumbed to cancer. He was not born out of uh, the karmic theory. He was not bound by the doctrine of karma as generally we are all bound by the action and reaction. He was none other than the Divine Supreme. But then he also suffered. But there is a difference in his suffering and our suffering. His suffering is for the sake of the humanity, just as the mother suffers for the sake of the child. And mother doesn't feel that suffering at all. On the other hand, she feels happy in that suffering. Because it is backed by, it is supported by mother's love. So also, we must cherish that spiritual love by which you will be able to love everything in this world. It should be 
you will revere everything in this world and every moment of your life you will be happy and blissful so not to make this vedanta prominent shri ramakrishna chose a special disciple swami vivekananda who was the embodiment of right discrimination and renunciation armed with these two swami vivekananda came into this world came into this west and propagated vedanta he did not lower himself into non spiritual ideal his ideal was always on the high level that is seeing god face to face so seeing god realizing god living the life spiritual is not fiction it is real in order to show that in order to show practical spirituality shri ramakrishna generously gave swami vivekananda to the west so we are having the spiritual knowledge open to everyone but we have to open our eyes and see we may bring the water near the mouth of a child but the child should open its mouth and drink the water that part the child has to do in the same way even though the spiritual knowledge is given by all the mahatmas still we are acting in a very foolish way in a very brutal way even though the nectar is given we are not drinking the nectar that is the sad part of the life going on in modern times so the rishis have emphatically declared the knower of brahman becomes brahman brahma vid brahmai va bhavati when you realize god you become that your whole being will be fully manifested by god and god alone so your ignorant self is totally annihilated and the supreme blissful self manifests in full glory the purpose of the upanishads is not mere intellectual satisfaction but a practical solution to the ultimate problems of life a famous dialogue between yama the god of death who was the knower of brahman and nachiketas a young brahmacharin pure in character well disciplined 
well spiritually formatted who had no desires of anything non spiritual the dialogue between emma and nachiketas very expressive and the divine glory of the reality has been well expounded in this kathopanishad one of the major 10 upanishads upanishads are many vedas are four rigveda yajurveda atharvaveda samaveda every veda has got upanishads all the upanishads deal with the reality of the universe the reality of the being the reality of everything the absolute reality all these upanishads point out to that absolute reality so here in kata upanishad nachiketas the eng brahmacharya was well formatted in spiritual aspiration he put questions to yama without any fear he had no fear at all because he was personification of purity and well formed character so he did not know what to mean by fear so he asked yama directly what happens to one's self after death millions of people every moment are dying where do they go does one exist after death or does he not the question is highly philosophical the very question asked by this boy nachiketas proved that he was really sincere and serious about pursuing spiritual path but immediately yama didn't want to disclose or give that knowledge to him before he put him into test it is like uh, before you sow the seed you must test the ground whether the ground is properly fertile so all the conditions are to be fulfilled so that the seed can sprout nicely and you'll be happy to see the sprouting of the plant so also here yama wanted to make sure that the question asked by nachiketas was not like a question asked by a kid it's not childish it was really very serious matter so he wanted to test this boy and so he tried to dissuade this boy from seeking an answer to a question which even gods find difficult to understand so instead of asking instead of answering him directly he talked in a indirect way he wanted to distract the attention of nachiketas so what he did was he offered a wide array of earthly comforts long life people love to live long you know even at the age of 100 he wants to still lingering on he wants to still linger on 
long life, but long life with good health is remarkable. Health, wealth, gold, elephants, horses, all types of pleasures which people generally hanker after. Nachiketa has offered all this. Look, boy, take all of this. You are a young boy. You should think of spirituality only afterwards. When? That he didn't say. Afterwards. But afterwards I don't know when. Well, that is the Maya part. How we are all under this spell of ignorance. Spell. We feel we are okay, though we are not at all okay. You are okay only if you are spiritual. You are certainly not okay if you are non-spiritual. So you can decide yourself whether you are spiritual or non-spiritual. So, Natsuketa was not an ordinary type of kid, you know. He was well behaved and well disciplined, who had tremendous good samskaras at the background, coming from a Rishi's family. So as soon as Natchikes has tried to put him in all sorts of temptations, he just, the boy just turned them down. He asked him counter question. Well, Master, you are offering all these things. Do they last long? Can I enjoy all these things which I have offered forever? I may be happy and blissful all the time. Nachiketas was very clear about these things. All these temptations only serve to wear out the senses of people. And so Yama could not answer this boy's question. Finally he had to agree that whatever the pleasures he had offered to him should not be understood as forever. For a long time, instead of normal, ordinarily people live for hundred years, you may live for five hundred years. Enjoy life for 500 years. But after 500 years, back to square one. So, so finally, Yama had to agree and he was very happy to see this uh, perfect uh, mind set up of this boy and so he imparted this uh, spiritual knowledge to him which is in the name of Kathopanishad which Swami Vivekananda always say please read Kathopanishad you will you will immensely enjoy and you will enjoy better if you live if you try to live spiritual life As all phenomena are transient in nature, worldly life ultimately leads to disappointment and suffering. Death puts an end to all our hopes and ridicules our achievements in life. Whatever the achievements you may have, you have to leave everything here. You can't take anything when you leave the body. So to be born again is only to go through the same grind. So the end of suffering is not to be born at all, 
but to become immortal to realize your immortal nature that is the end of all suffering when you realize you are the child of immortality amritasya putraha amritasya beautiful word when you realize that you will say that you don't have suffering anymore you will be beaming with joy beaming that's why a person who has reached the highest state of purity will be overwhelmed with joy so he gets into samadhi it is ecstatic state where his mind totally absorbs itself in the ideal so the teaching of the upanishads falls under the following three categories one the self or essence of a person man or woman also called atman the self or essence of the world brahman the third category the relation between atman and brahman so three categories one category the self or essence of man atman second the self or essence of the world brahman third the relation between atman and brahman according to the upanishads when knowledge of one's self atman is required is acquired knowledge of the essence of the world brahman as well as the relation between atman and brahman is known first atman that is the indwelling consciousness in every being the english translation they call it a spirit it's a extremely weak word for the high sublime word atman so i better use atman instead of saying spirit spirit so atman always you feel atman means the reality in yourself the one which is behind the one which is behind i who is that i atman that is that i so because we are superimposing that i in other things so we have lost the memory of our real self atman so the spiritual practice we find a clear exposition of the doctrine of the atman and the practical path leading to it in the dialogue between the sage prajapati and indra the god of heavens in the chandogya upanishad another famous upanishads indra the king of gods and virochana the king of demons that means who is totally fully non spiritual who is very aggressive who indulges himself in all sorts of uh, pleasures and things of the world who is infatuated with hatred jealousy anger all these things in an excessive measure a man who possesses these things in an excessive way is called is to be called a demon so there was a person called virochana the king of demons and indra the king of gods both these approach prajapati 
to learn the doctrine of the self. Somehow that idea came to them that they have to find out who is that Atman. So at the outset Prajapati teaches them that the self is unborn, uncreated, eternal, cannot be destroyed and beyond suffering. That is Atman. And that is in you, in him, in everyone. Then he identifies his self with the body. Well, Virochan, the king of demons, returns home satisfied. He was quite happy to learn that Atman is uh, associated with the body, mind and senses. And so he began to enjoy the world immensely, thousandfold more than what he was enjoying before. Whereas Indra, the god of gods, the god of heavens, after meditating for a while, he was not convinced. How can the immortal self be the body which is prone to change, which is prone to decay, which is prone to destruction. So Indra approached Prajapati again and he told him out of his and told him his confusion. He was not happy. Then Prajapati next identifies himself with the subject of the dream state. Again Indra was not convinced. How could the subject of the dream state be the eternal self? Though devoid of defects of the body, it still experiences emotions in dreams. It is happy, sad, terrified, conscious of pain, etc. The self being eternal cannot be subject to such limitations. So again he goes back to Prajapati and tells him his doubts. Prajapati now tells him that the enjoyer of the deep sleep state is the Self. But Indra is unconvinced by this too, for in deep sleep there is no conscious or awareness. We neither feel anything nor know anything nor will anything. We don't feel anything. So what good is there in such a state when we don't know anything at all? When he approaches Prajapati again, the sage will be, uh, the sage, well pleased with his uh, discriminatory powers. And then he said, Dear Narin, dear Indra, the body and the subject of the dream state are not the self, though they exist for the self. The self is not an abstract principle of the deep sleep state too, yet it is something which persists through these three states or else we could not have the unity of experience through the three states. The body, the senses, the mind, the presentation, continuum, the consciousness are all mere instruments and objects of the self. Though the self is the ground for the waking, dream and deep sleep states, it prints them transcends them all. The Self is immortal. Self, I am referring not your mind. Self means capital Yes, Atman. It is immortal. It is self-luminous and self-proved. It is the ultimate object, subject object one in that Self, which can never become an object and is necessarily presupposed by all knowledge. So, that means it is the ultimate subject only. No question of object there. It can never become an object. It is Satchitananda. Existence, knowledge, bliss. But if we are in truth the eternal Atman, why do we not know it? The Upanishads say, 
that it is due to our ignorance that we are not aware of the true nature of ourselves when ignorance is removed with right knowledge the self the atman shines forth in its true nature in fact acquisition of spiritual knowledge is the supreme purpose of human existence human beings are superior to other forms of life only because they can sufficiently discriminate between the real and the unreal between the ephemeral and the eternal between darkness and light a man who doesn't strive to make good of this opportunity and remains lost in materialism has as if committed suicide the isha was upanishad one of the other one of the major 10 upanishads it declares the immutable soul is the real nature of man and not his mortal frame because the soul endures from one life to the next whereas the body changes every moment and perishes with death but the materialistic people enveloped with ignorance vanity or pride deny the very existence of the soul they say only that exists which can be perceived with the senses there is nothing beyond there is no yonder world after death verily man is but an agglomeration of the elements born of the lust we are born with our physical birth and cease to exist after our death indeed there is no connection between actions and their fruits there no wise no wise or virtue so ye drink and be merry denying their own true essence this uh, in our uh, hindu tradition we call it as nastik vada you don't know what will happen afterwards why do you worry enjoy life immediately doesn't matter even if you have to steal and earn money by whatever means don't worry enjoy that's their way of life right knowledge is not mere bookish knowledge in fact the upanishads equate even the sacred veda which deals with all kamya karmas as apara vidya lower knowledge while knowledge of the self atma jnana is the highest knowledge this knowledge sort is more intuitive than intellectual it is a knowledge of the subject which can never be known like an object right knowledge is obtained with the practice of faith purity introversion and meditation two ways of meditation are suggested these are suggested by the upanishads meditation on the mystic syllable om and meditation on the heart center recourse to spirituality does not mean that one can forget his worldly duties people always get into conflict that's why many people are scared to take spiritual life they think what happened to their worldly things the upanishads stress again and again that faith without works is dead as an example the ishavas upanishad says seek not the truth by abandoning this world or by renouncing all your bound and duties this is indeed not the path of salvation this is indeed not the path of salvation rather desire ye to live a full life of 100 years actively engaged in the self 
selfless performance of your duties and enjoined actions at all times. Verily, this is the only way enjoined for man's salvation and not the opposite. All actions bear fruit, good or bad, and these fruits taint his soul, causing him to be reborn. But the fruits of actions, good or otherwise, don't taint that wise man who performs his duties selflessly as an offering to God, just as a lotus leaf he is not tainted by water, even though touching it. But he who, through ignorance, shirks away from his duties, merely deludes himself by thinking, I am performing any action. A hey, no man can desist from action for even a single moment. So, that's about the Atman, the Upanishad has clearly stated the inner reality of everyone, every being is that Atman, immortal in its nature. If the true self of man is the Atman or reality, what about matter and the psychological mechanism? The Upanishads are very clear that Brahman is the origin and the end of the world. It is a material cause of the world and the world is a manifestation of Brahman. Brahman made the world out of itself. In the Chandogya Upanishads it is said, in the beginning the world was just being one only without a second. Then it thought to itself, would that I were many, let me procreate myself. Again, all this is verily Brahman. Brahman is that from which everything proceeds, that in which everything breathes, and that in which everything is finally dissolved. So Brahman is a substratum of everything. A theory of evolution is presented in the doctrine of the Panchakosha or the five sheets in the Taitri Upanishad, another famous uh, Upanishad among the ten Upanishads. The five sheets are described there. The lowest level is the Annamaya Kosha, that is the plane of matter. Matter is jada or devoid of consciousness and must evolve to life. So the second stage is pranamaya kosha, the plane of life. Vegetables are an example of this kosha. From life evolves per perceptual consciousness and thus we have the manomaya kosha or the mental plane. But this is still instinctive consciousness and can be related to that of animals. From instinctive consciousness evolves consciousness which is self-conscious or rational. This is Vijnanamaya Kosha or the plane of self-conscious reason. This is the base for moral life and that which distinguishes man from animal. This is also the plane where the empirical trinity of knower, known and knowledge exist. When the trinity of the knower, known and knowledge become fused in a transcendental unity, we have the highest state of evolution, that is Anandamaya Kosha, or non-dual bliss. Then a question may be asked, so does this evolution mean that the original Brahman is lost? The answer is no. The Upanishads are firm 
that all such evolution is only in the level of name and form and the original nature of reality is never lost analogy is equating brahman to clay in a clay pot or gold in an ornament are used to bring home the point though name and form might vary the essence remains the same all the stages of evolution are but manifestations of brahman which is the soul of all matter all matter and life soul of all matter and life sarva bhuta antaratma it pervades all phenomena and is the inner controller of all it's called in sanskrit antaryamin for fear of him fire burns for fear of him the sun shines and for fear of him the winds the clouds and death perform their office so in its very opening verse the isha was upanishad reminds us that brahman is the essence of existence all sentient and insentient objects in this ever changing universe are ephemeral and pass away with time but the lord who is immanent in everything and controls it in multifarious ways is eternal and imperishable seek to realize this eternal truth and do not get entangled in this world enjoy the bounties of nature but with a sense of renunciation do not hanker too much after riches and do not get obsessed with them to whom does all this belong certainly not to any one for we don't bring anything with tum brahmasmi i am brahman both identify brahman to one own self that is one own atman but what is the exact what is the exact nature of their relationship this is the focal point of difference between the various schools of vedanta are they one and the same the advaita school of vedanta takes this stand and gives forth a full fledged non dualistic absolutism but if the atman is eternal and unchanging what about the changes experienced in the world according to advaita vedanta the changes in the world are unreal mithya and an illusion maya is brahman and atman related in the way of part to whole or quality to object this is the theory of the vishishta advaita school of vedanta which teaches qualified non dualism that is the world and the selves are qualities of brahman are brahman and atman totally different this cannot be for it is explicitly taught in the upanishads that brahman is the material cause of this world and the world is the manifestation of brahman but still the dvaita school of vedanta the dualist argues from this angle and presents a scheme where god selves and matter are totally distinct and independent realities they say all the three are real actually the dualistic interpretation of the upanishads as presented by the dvaita school of vedanta is not a new phenomenon the sankhya yoga nyaya vaisheshika and purva mimamsa all these systems of philosophy are claiming to be the correct interpreters of the upanishads to propound a dualist they also uh, claim they are the true interpreters of the upanishads so excerpts from two remarkable passages from the upanishads i shall try to tell now which will explain this matter very clearly one from the brahmanani upanishad and the other one from chandogya upanishad 
the first one is the famous dialogue between the greatest of indian sages that is in brazanic upanishad the famous rishi agyavalkya and his noble wife maitreyi it's a famous dialogue the second one is the dialogue between the sage uddalaka aruni and his son shvetaketu where the relationship between brahman and atman is taught so maitri was aspiring for spiritual knowledge yagya valkya wanted to move on to the forest not to live a vanapastha way of life so yagyavalkya told maitri maitri i am getting away from the state of householder let me make a settlement for you my lord said maitri even if the riches of the world were mine would it make me immortal no said yagyavalkya your life will only be like the life of people with plenty of wealth <coughs> but there is no hope of immortality through wealth don't expect immortality that you can achieve immortality through wealth ಕರ್ಮಣಾನ ಪ್ರಜೆಯ ಧನೆ ನತ್ಯಾಗೆ ನೈಕೆ ಅಮೃತತ್ವಮಾನಶು ಫೇಮಸ್ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಡಿಕ್ಲೇರ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಇಮಾರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅಟೆಂಡ್ ಬೈ ವೆಲ್ತ್ ಆರ್ ಬೈ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆರ್ ಬೈ ಪ್ರಾಜನಿ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಥ್ರೂ ಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಫೈಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಥ್ರೂ ರಿನೌನ್ಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಒನ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಅಟೆಂಡ್ ಇಮಾರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ದೆನ್ ಮೈತ್ರಿ ಇಸ್ ಸೆಡ್ what shall i do with that by which i don't become a mortal please explain to me whatever you know of immortality then yagyavalkya said you were always dear to me maitreyi but now you have become dearer so as you wish i shall explain it to you but as i expound seek to meditate on it then he said well verily not for the sake of the husband is the husband dear but for the sake of the self is the husband dear verily not for the sake of the wife is the wife dear but for the sake of the self is the wife dear so like that he keeps on telling various stages in life and uh, he asked maitri to meditate upon the ideas what he had said as a mass of salt is all together a mass of taste without inside or outside so is the self all together a mass of intelligence without inside or outside having arisen out of these elements it vanishes again in them when it has departed there is no more separate or particular consciousness then maitri said here indeed venerable sir you have caused me to reach utter bewilderment i don't all i do not at all understand this atman yagya valkya replied i don't say anything bewildering the self atman verily is imperishable and of indestructible nature for where there is duality there one sees another one smells another one tastes another one speaks to another one hears another one thinks of another one touches and knows another but when everything has become one sown self by what and whom should one see by what and whom should one smell taste speak hear think touch and know 
But by what should we know him by whom all this is known? Indeed, by what would one know the knower? The self is to be described as not this, not this. He is incomprehensible, indestructible, unattached, unfettered. He doesn't suffer. Thus you have the instruction expounded to you. O Maitri, such verily is life eternal. He taught her this Upanishadic teaching and then left for forest. Then I am trying to explain this from Chantagya Upanishad. <coughs> As when the bees collect honey from different trees, mix them up and reduce them to a unity and the essences are not able to discriminate that I am the essence of this tree, I am the essence of that tree. Even so, all creatures, though they reach being in deep sleep, they do not know it. That which is the finest essence, that is the whole world, has its self, that is Atman, that is reality, that art thou, Shvetakit. As the various rivers <coughs> which flow into the ocean and become the ocean itself, losing their individuality, they know not that I am this river, I am that river. Likewise, though all creatures here in this world have come forth from being, they do not know that they have come forth from being. That which is the finest essence, that this whole world has its self, that is Atman, that is reality, that art thou, Shweta Ketu. Then he says, the teacher asks Shweta Ketu, bring a fruit from that negro, that tree. He brought the tree, he brought the seed. Break it open, it was opened. What do you see there? Fine seeds. Break open the seed. It's opened. What do you see now? Nothing, sir. Then the Uddhalaka said to him, Verily, my dear son, that subtle essence which you do not perceive, verily, my dear, from that the great Negro that tree exists. Believe me. That which is the finest essence that this whole world has as itself, that is Atman, that is reality, that art thou. So, very nicely Uddhalaka has explained uh, the teaching of the Upanishads and if you come to know about this reality, then you will see everything as nothing but God. Once Sri Ramakrishna had a vision, and Sri Ramakrishna himself described it. He said, do you know what I see right now? I see that it is God Himself who has become all this. It seems to me that men and other living beings are made of leather and it is God Himself who dwelling inside these leather cases moves the hands, the feet, the heads. I had a similar vision before when I saw houses gardens, roads, men, cattle, all made of one substance. It was as if they were all made of wax. Sri Ramakrishna tells this in the Gospel. With Sri Ramakrishna, this was not an isolated experience occurring at the height of spiritual ecstasy. He actually lived always at this level of consciousness. Nay, he could transmit this experience at will 
to competent recipients one day shri ramakrishna tried to bring home to swami vivekananda then narendra nath the truth that all was brahman but narendra could not believe immediately narendra left the room and going to pratap chandra hazra and narendra was telling him how can this be this jag is god this cup is god and we too are god nothing can be more preposterous narendra is telling he did not believe what shiram had said hearing narendra derisive laughter shiram ne came out now i must teach him a lesson he came out and touched narendra that one magic touch of the master brought about a wonderful change over narendra's mind narendra actually saw that there was nothing in the universe but god he found that the food the plate the person who served and even he himself was nothing but brahman he felt that the cabs playing on their li- playing on the road as well as the horses were made of the same stuff this state remained for a few days when there is a slight change in that state the world began to appear dream like he would then strike his head at the iron railings to see whether they were real or only a dream this experience continued for some days while explaining the unreality of the world to his western audience swami vivekananda once described one of his experiences which he had while traveling through the deserts of india he would see lakes full of water with the reflection of trees as he walked along one day he felt thirsty and proceeded towards one of these lakes for water but the lakes went on receding from him in a flash narendra vivekananda realized that it was a mirage next day he saw the lakes as usual but now he was not tempted and knew that they were mirages describing describing this experience swami vivekananda told his audience that after spiritual realization one might still continue to see the world but one will be convinced of its unreality and would not be affected by its allurements or terrors there's another experience which swami vivekananda had at the magic touch of shri ramakrishna during one of his earliest visits to dakshineshwar narendra saw with open eyes the walls and everything in the room whirling rapidly and vanishing into the void and the whole universe and even his individuality was about to merge in an all encompassing mysterious void frightened at such an impending death of his ego narendra shouted what are you doing he was addressing shri ramakrishna what are you doing i am a parents at this shri ramakrishna again touched him and brought him back to normal consciousness it is believed that shri ramakrishna wanted that day to impart to narendra nath the experience of nirvikalpa samadhi in which even the ego and mind are dissolved later by the grace of shri ramakrishna narendra nath did have that supreme experience while he has clearly described his other experiences swami vivekananda has never described the experience of nirvikalpa samadhi except probably in negative terms in his poem a hymn to samadhi we can anyway 
we have to study this and understand the reality in the real sense of the term and analyzing the experiences which swami vivekananda had we find in them two entities or elements the presence of god and the world of name and form at the touch of shri ram krishna swami vivekananda first saw god in everything rather everything is god when the intensity of that experience got reduced he did not see god but he experienced the phenomenal world as a dream unreal and the third example he continued to see water in the desert but knew for certain that it was an illusion in the first case experience of the reality of god was the main fact in the second the phenomenal world did not appear as real as in the waking state but there was no experience of god and the third water in the mirage continued to appear as water but its illusion nature was revealed the first experience has a strong positive content while the other two are more negative in the sense that they stress the re- unreality of the world thus god in everything could mean the world may disappear completely it may appear as god or it may appear unreal there could be various grades and combinations of these three elements in the experience what we term god in everything well it's a very sublime subject the message of the upanishads the more we dwell upon these ideas the more it inspires us to meditate upon the spiritual ideas more and more so we have to prepare our mind we have to know the technique of detaching ourselves from the external things and we must know the technique of meditation and follow it up not losing sight of our spiritual goal so the goal must be properly fixed up and spiritual life must be led then we really understand and experience the message of the upanishad that the only reality that is ever existent is god and god alone with these words i conclude my talk thank you very much we have got very important program in the month of july that is guru purnima it is a very special day for all the spiritual aspirants the day all the spiritual aspirants should worship their guru and shri ramakrishna is sachidananda guru vyasa maharshi who gave the vedas and all the sacred scriptures he is being worshiped on that day so the program begins in the evening after the aarti at 6 pm followed by bhajans brief talk and then special worship at 7 o'clock then flower offerings then the program will be concluded prasad distribution will be there we have very special program in the month of august first sunday to succeeding sunday children's camp that's our annual event which we do every year and another important uh, announcement i wanted to make most probably most of you know that uh, we are planning to find a new location so that we may have a nice new sh- shri ramakrishna universal temple 
with sufficient place for parking the cars providing all the facilities required for the devotees for for coming and staying and all the necessary facilities will be provided and so virtually we are looking for a more bigger place so that large number of people can come freely they should be able to enjoy this peaceful and spiritual atmosphere so we are exploring the possibilities of finding a location in chicago suburb of course it involves lot of money no doubt but still i think is impossible and we have to face this challenge and i hope all the devotees will help in this project so that it is beneficial to everyone who comes in contact with vedanta movement and swami vivekananda used to say in america chicago is my home so we have to have a nice home for swami vivekananda and it should have temple feature what we see the existing buildings and whatever it is they look like residential homes but temple feature it has got its own characteristics and uh, it's a great uh, temple architecture it is all well described in the vastu shilpa shastra a famous uh, sanskrit text is just like veda we got text for uh, constructing the temple how it should be done in what manner and so on so all these things can be taken care of properly and uh, it should be what i mean to say it should be done in a very nice way befitting the standard of america all the people who come to america should come to chicago they do come and they should be able to see the universal temple where all people belonging to different religions coming together and having immense peace and joy living the life of peace and harmony not simply theory in shri ramakrishna everything is practical theory and practice should go together that is shri ramakrishna so whatever you feel whatever from your heart you are inspired you are welcome to contribute to this project and you must know it requires lot of money so accordingly try to be more liberal that means suppose you are capable of giving 500 dollars give 1000 dollars is the tendency is your person is capable of giving 1000 dollars he will give 500 dollars so i am putting this on another way that means since it is since it is everything is costly in america but you must see the future also it's growing and we have to look into the future of all the spiritual aspirants who want to come to vedanta so we should you we should have a place for such people om sahana bhavatu sahana bhunaktu sahaviryam karavahai tejasvi navadhi tamastu va vidvishavahai om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna arpana bhastu may the lord protect us 
may he nourish us, may our knowledge be fruitful and enlightened, may we not hate each other, peace, peace, peace be unto all.